Okay, today is Friday, May 16th. We're sitting in my living room in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm Jonathan Barnett, and uh, this is the infamous, notorious <laughs> J. <laughs> Todd Deshaun. And some of you will know who we are, and some of you won't. So, uh, quickly, I'm, I'm oh, and there's a new one. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Todd and I uh, met online in a pretty adversarial way. I'm, uh, we're both, we have some things in common. We're both gay men, both living with AIDS or HIV, however you want to call it. And uh, I, I was in, I've been involved with the, uh, what's called the AIDS dissident community. And Todd is on the other side of this fence called, uh, are you okay calling it AIDS orthodoxy? Or what's, okay. what, what, what label do you want to wear? That's fine. Okay. As, long as, as long as the dress has a label, he'll wear it. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a point at which um, Todd, Todd was blogging and really uh, taking AIDS dissidents to task. And uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, we all, we all have, we'll probably have different recovered memories on how we actually got into, uh, um, oh, I posted a picture of my leg. Yeah. Yeah. This, this lovely... Leg. I'm not even going to show it here now. You can see this. Not so. Not bad. Uh, and, and I don't want to go into a lot of a lot of a lot of details. We we we, were, we just we kept posting back and forth in a in a real uh, hostile adver adversarial way. And uh, at some point, uh, uh, we made contact and found some common ground. And so. We're going to take advantage of sharing that and letting you, letting you see a little conversation between us. And I don't want to hog the mic here, but uh, um, I want to give a little background of who we are and how we got here. And uh, what's changed, if anything, if we've changed each other's minds about uh, HIV and AIDS and how to, how to live with that and how to deal with that. Yeah. I've just came from this, the scientific background part of it. Um, but I'm open to, I feel like I'm more open than the other side is open, except for you. I mean, you, you display how you're open to new things. Um, and I've learned from you, like, this new stuff that's going on as we discussed with this, um, the dosing, dosing things down and stuff, and I actually may try that. <clears throat> but, um, so yeah, we've got some common ground. Well, now on your blog, you used to really sing the praises of the drugs. The well, that's one thing that freaked you out when I first told you that I had taken drug holidays, and I went for a whole year without my medication because I couldn't afford it because of the fucking pharmaceutical companies. And you, oh my God, I thought you love pharmaceutical companies. Like, no, they screw me just the way they screw everybody but, else. But you would say that you used to really argue that the drugs were... Well, oh, I think the drugs work. The drugs... And that there aren't any... You don't have any problems with them. You don't have any adverse effects. No, that's not true. The AZT. I, when I first took AZT, I think I told you that. I was like, oh, oh my God, I hated it. I took it for like three weeks. And I, um, yeah, I hated it. All I wanted to do was eat triple cheeseburgers from Wendy's. That's all I wanted to do. But I also just felt gross. And so I told my doctor, so I'm not going to take it. And he said, oh, you'll get used to it. And I said, nope, give me something else. So he gave me something else, and I also took DDI back when it was powder. You would put it in water, stir it up, it completely dissolved. There was no taste, no smell, but I couldn't get it down for some reason. So I told him, I'm not, I'm not taking that either. I just told him, he said, oh, come on, just keep trying it. And I said, nope, give me something else. So that's what I don't understand people who have problems with the medication, and I won't say any names, but there's one person I really could say some names about, but um, she's no longer with us. <coughs> So I don't understand people who have problems with the medication that try to just tough it out, tough it out. If something doesn't work for you, change medications. Because, because like I've told you, like, look, and since then, every medication I've taken, I've had no side effects whatsoever. I've had no, you know, when did bad you, feelings or anything about it. When did you test positive? Uh, 95. November of 95. I tested positive in 98. <clears throat> After, I should have tested positive long before that, according to the the mainstream point of view, but I didn't. And the drugs, and it was post protease inhibitors, so it was uh, uh, Virocept, I think, and uh, Epivir and Zeret. I'm not, those are the brand names. I'm not sure what that was. Zeret. 
and they just they just messed me up so much I could I mean that the diarrhea was uncontrollable and every time I had a complaint the doctor would just prescribed another drug for the side effects until I just I decided I mean this this sounds dramatic and I don't I'm not trying to exaggerate it I really finally got to the point where if this is life I just assume die is put up with this not really you know, I want to quit them. so we didn't we didn't try to find other you know I just I just I, I didn't I didn't try to find something different um, and and what happened was that I found that I could manage without those drugs um, though they kept me on a lot of other drugs I was still taking 24 prescription drugs in 06 and even though I had been off the, the antiviral since 2000 or 2001 and uh, and it was finally my what transformed me was when I quit all those drugs and that's when I really felt a relief from my body. And if Michael would come in here and tell you, or any of my family, what I was like mm -hmm. on all those drugs compared to now. Yeah, that's it's, ridiculous. It's night and day. I agree with you that the pharmaceutical companies, like well, doctors in general, like if you have one ailment, they'll prescribe something for that ailment, and blah, 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 instead of trying to find the underlying cause and just treat the cause and not the symptom. Or whatever. I, I think other AIDS dissidents that are watching this are going to say, who are you? Because this isn't the Todd Deshaun. That they came to know and love from uh, the blog. This is for dummies. But also, when you get into those blogs, you know, you're talking about there's one discussion, and then of course, those unfortunately, veer wildly off track, and people don't, you know, it's ridiculous right. the way those comment threads go. But <clears throat> I think I usually deal with the subject at hand when I'm talking about things. But I still think the medications work, and I think everybody's experience with medications are different. And I don't, if you're having a doctor that's just treating your symptoms or every time you have something he's just giving you another medication for, I think you need to find another doctor. Well, you know why I took you on? It wasn't because your point of view, it was because of your style. You were, you, oh, were, okay. you were vicious, nasty, but and hateful. To everybody was vicious. That's what you forget. The other side was vicious, nasty, and hateful. When I first, it felt that way to you, but I didn't, I, you know, I, it seems like you started it. Now, when I got into it, this was already going on when I got into it. I mean, I would go through, when I first sent you that email about your leg, it was a sincere, nice email. There was no hatefulness to it. But because of your perception of me already, you took it as hateful. I, I, I was See? I was biased um, already because I didn't like you. But oh, I was also offended. So so how, how could you take a look at a picture and tell me that's capitalists? Do you, seeing it in person, would you think that's capital? I didn't say it was. I said it looks like it might be, and you should. And I said you should see a doctor about it. I didn't I say had, this is what it is and deal with okay, it. Okay, well, on my end, uh -huh. I'm like five or six doctors have seen this uh -huh. and told me. I mean, it's like I was insulted. Okay, uh -huh. bottom line, yeah, I, it was like, well, you little, but I didn't diagnose you. I said to me, it looks like it might be, you know, and therefore you might want to. This is how it got. This is how it started. Yeah, right. This is how it started. Right. And then I, I would, that put me on mm -hmm. in, a, in a sort of battle, combative right. mode, and it went, it, it went from there. Yeah. And man, we did it, didn't we? Yeah. But also there was some, um, and, but, but don't forget, you know, you say like, it's all my fault, or not all my fault, but I mean, you're saying like, I was the one who started the combativeness and all that. Don't forget, Michael Geiger was out there saying horrible things about, John Moore and all these other people. John Moore. <laughs> but I'm saying the whole thing was going on. Before John Moore. Right. I mean, we all ought to be prosecuted and imprisoned. I mean, and both sides were going back and forth saying yeah, that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It, don't say the distance is all sweet and the. Okay. Well, I think I, I, I would so, agree with you. I think both sides were assholes to each other completely. I think they really wanted to get go. That's my opinion. I think there are crazy people on both sides. Oh of yeah. This divide. Yeah. And. Uh, and, and as you know, I've, I've moved, well, I wrote a blog post uh, at the end of 2013 saying farewell to dissidents mm -hmm. because I'd just gone, got, gotten fed up with the, with what I was seeing from being, being involved for maybe five years. But I, it's a small, it's a, it's a fairly small, uh, dare I say, intimate community. So yeah. it doesn't take a lot of time to get to know a goodly number of of the of the personalities and players, I, I'm right. not saying I met everybody. I didn't, oh, no. but I, I I knew quite a few uh, of them. And and, and you're the one that's vocal about how you have evolving mindsets. Like you'll you'll take new information and process it and say and change your mind if you feel like you need to. That's but most people out there 
on the distant side, in my opinion, from what I've seen, hold on to something with such tenacity that they don't want to let it go. I, I, I have to agree with you. And I'm currently in, engaged with, uh, with uh, specifically with rethinking AIDS and uh, about what I what I call this dogmatism yeah. in the AIDS system. I, I, I wrote to, uh, I think it was Henry Bauer, uh, an email, and I, I, I this is the first time I've put it this way, so I'm going to share with you. There, there, AIDS dissidents, it's a big, it's a, actually it's a big idea, it's a big concept, and not everybody follows the same thinking on it. But there is a group, the predominant group is Rethinking AIDS. The predominant public projection of that is the Rethinking AIDS Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And people like me and others who have gone, you know, reached a point where we think we need to resort to some form of antiretroviral therapy are not welcome there. And there, so there's this sort of litmus test that's evolved. And, it, and it, there's three, I say call it just three commandments. So, you know, one, first one is uh, never test, never get an antibody test. Right. You know, if you don't know, what you don't know won't hurt you. Because once you take the test and you're, you've fallen into the rabbit hole and you're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then the second commandment is, if you've already, if you have, if you do test positive, just ignore that. Right. Don't pay any attention to that. Then the second is never, never test for the surrogate markers, the CD4 count, the viral load, uh, because they're meaningless. They have no meaning whatsoever, and, and if you do, ignore them. And then the third commandment is, uh, under no circumstances, ever, ever, no matter what kind of shape you're in, take ARV drugs, right. because they're toxic poisons and they'll kill you, they'll stop all of this stuff. And it's <laughs> like, if you, if you violate any of those, uh-huh. or let alone all of those commandments, you're, you're no longer in the tribe. Uh-huh. You're no longer one of us. You're, and, and think about what I'm just talking about. What does that sound like? Sounds like a fundamentalist religious church, right. which yeah. is exactly what they accuse right. the Orthodox is. So I'm like, now that I've become the, the pariah, the, the out, not with everybody, in fact, not with a lot of people. Yeah. The, 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 the people that I'm still connected with, they're no longer acting, they're not no longer participating publicly. So they've basically forfeited the, the debate and the stage to the, the, those that are remaining. Right. That are, yeah. They're locked in this dogmatic mindset, and it's it's embarrassing and it's frustrating. Yeah. And um, yeah, like what you said, that's one thing that bothers me. Is like if you're in that community on your side or whatever the distant side, and then you do, God forbid, start taking antiretroviral, you better be on your deathbed, and you know otherwise they're going to kick you out and never speak to you again, and they will speak badly of you. And if you are taking antiretrovirals when you die. Then they're going to start going all over the internet saying you died because of the antiretroviral, not because of whatever underlying cause it may have been. If you've ever taken antiretrovirals, um, and they talk about grave dancing, and they say that we do it, but they do it. To, you know, both sides are horrible. Well, about, yeah, no, I, I think I think the orthodox side still holds the uh, the ri- red ribbon for really castigating anybody because they don't discern between you know the denial. I'll, I'll call them denialists. I don't have any problem with that. Um, and that was that was one of the campaigns that just made me rock my head was the campaign to ban the word denialist from the media. Oh, and I was, uh, okay, so let's guess when we're going to start burning books. <laughs> That's what's that all about. Try to call me orthodox if you want to. I don't care. Call me Shirley if you want. I'll so, Well, okay, but getting back to, and I think things have changed. This, but I want to kind of give a point of reference. You, you, you're, when you were blogging, you know, the message that I got and a lot of people got was that you were really a cheerleader for the ARV drugs. Uh-huh. And so you, you also got stuck with this, you, I, you were accused of being a pharmacist, like, of being paid I, by pharmacists. So how many checks did you cash up? Uh, you saw my car. What do I drive? An 04 Nissan Maxima. What, so what's that car? It's 10 years old. It's got 111,000 miles on it. I think I would have driven my Mercedes here if I was getting paid. It's just ridiculous, this whole conspiracy theory that I'm working for. Well, you didn't for. ask the question. Do you have okay. any money? Have you ever never, received any conversation of any never. sort? Okay. No. One time I wrote for... Um, I just wanted your chance to get it right there on the right. No, we, we can say, uh, I can tell you about what's going on. Part of this with this, I can't really talk about the lawsuit, but part of the lawsuit, Clark Baker claims that I have been paid. I'm paid pharmaceutical shill. And there's one post that I did write that I... And, I, and the title was, I've, I've done what Celia Farber was never able to do. I got paid to write. I got $30 for writing a post for splicetoday.com. Right. 30 bucks. 
And I never, I never, had, I never actually even got the money because I would have had to gone down to a fax machine, fill out a W four form, fax it in. I said, "Fuck it, for thirty dollars, I'm not going to go down and do that." <laughs> I so, don't want to get to have a chance so to no, just no, completely. Okay. You've told me that personally, and I have. I've told people I have no reason to to, to doubt you uh-huh. on that account. And it bothers me that that when when people make allegations that they can't. But me just saying that here right now doesn't matter. Nobody's still going to believe it. That's okay. No, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I don't give a shit what people think about me or I, believe about me. I don't care. I, I think you know. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to go on this. Is, if you want to talk a little bit about what you're, what's, what's, you know. Clark Baker and I both have sort of taken you to task through your employer. Uh-huh. And I've apologized for that right. because I've tried to put myself in your shoes uh-huh. and I'm thinking, you know, how would I feel if I was at work and somebody was trying to use my employer? I, I did have some grounds for, for the one. Yes, you had, thing. I had one legitimate shot. And, and then I found, it. and, and I told you this. It's like all fair and love and war, and I figured that was your weak point. Uh-huh. So I used it again, you know. Uh-huh. And um, I'm not proud of that. I'm kind of, kind of, kind of clean on that. But you, you took down the blog uh, because I'm stupid. Let me tell you why I took the blog down. I'm so, I'm such a slow thinker that I it never really quite got. You know, me. somebody's gonna pick up that. Pull quote when you just said I'm stupid. I know. Close. You're going to just see that on YouTube now being played over and over again. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm stupid. stupid. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. Uh, uh, I can admit my weak points. I don't care. I'm pretty stupid. I would have been smart if, if I'd have realized, okay, that's my weakness. Like, because every six months like clockwork, it was either you or Clark Baker, because I know for sure Clark Baker did it at least once. Well, then that's all I'll say. But he's taking credit for my blog going down. I took it down voluntarily because I was getting sick of them harassing me through my employer. They weren't just harassing me, they are harassing the IT people, the HR people. So it got to the point where they would just call me up on the phone and go, okay, you need to go to this comment thread and post the words, these are my opinions and not those of my employer. <clears throat> so it kind of got to be a joke around Baylor that it kept happening. So finally I decided, okay, if I have to shut down the blog, then I take away their power to come after me. So that's why I did that. And I stayed employed with Baylor through the whole thing. They just got to be kind of a joke and a pain in the ass for them to constantly, because every time someone would call us a complaint, they would have to look into it. The IT people would look at the computer to see if I'm looking at this shit off the computer I wasn't supposed to. And I never got fired for it, so obviously I wasn't doing anything wrong. So so that went away. I, I did have a copy of it because that's one of the ha- uh, habits, hobbies I have is backing up websites that I think might disappear. But uh, oh, yeah, that should have been the end of it. And I have the DVD that you sent me. Thank you for that because I <laughs> oh, no, it would have been lost. Don't tell on me. Don't <laughs> tell on me. I'm consorting with the enemy. I know. So how did that happen? <clears throat> what? How did we go from being enemies to being able to sit and talk <clears throat> and have a conversation? Because I was pretty hard. You you. Did you find it difficult to break through to get my get me to talk to you? I really I really held it against you. I was not going to let you. Yeah. I uh, forget exactly how it happened. I think finally we just like I said. Through I think. Well, I reposted your blog. Yeah, yeah. Did that prompt you? I think that. I don't remember. You didn't seem to. Well, I had sent you an email pretty like a while back and said. Remember when I still had distance for Donnie, I said that we should do a point-counterpoint thing, and then you shot that down and said, no, let's not do that. So we were always kind of in a private communication every now and then with stuff. And I said, I'd love to sit across the table yeah. and, and talk to you face yeah. face. I just couldn't understand why there was this... To me, this whole dissident orthodox split is not going to get resolved, and I've had conversations with some really key people on the dissident side that have shared this with me, too is we have to find some common ground and start talking. Yeah. Because and when we started doing that, we found that we had more things in common than we realized. Uh-huh. When yeah. you told me you had quit the drugs, I was shocked. Yeah. I like, my God, this guy is the, you know, the, the poster child for taking drugs after, I after the after drugs Jay Simpson and and that you quit them. I mean this for is you. this is that's considered that's that's that is breaking every Bit of orthodox. No, you been, never quit the drugs. You now there's been research out there about you could take um, drug holidays for six months or something. Uh, they really promote that research, don't they, God? 
Well, no, no. Motive, but no, I mean... Most, but, most, most people... But if you're, but if you're, if you're aware of your status and you're aware of your... Kaylee uh, is your health and how to take care of your health, then you might... You would know that. Uh, that's a dog tale, in case you can't tell. <laughs> so, no, I still think the drugs work, and I think people need to... You know, it's not, like I said, if the drug's not working for you, if you any bad side effects, try something different. Oh, when I said about AZT and how shitty it made me feel, now people are going to go, see, Todd even says AZT is killing people. Oh, my God, if I see one more dissident say some bullshit about how AZT is killing people, it was high dosage back then. Don't forget that HIV, this whole thing, was killing people left and right. Their act up was out there screaming for a medication. No one else buys stuff. They wanted medication. They wanted AZG. I was one of them. Yeah, they started. They started. The, they didn't know where to start the dosage, so that's where they started. They had to pick something. They could have picked one milligram. They could have picked ten thousand milligrams. They didn't know what to choose, so you know they they took an educated guess, and that's what they started with. Maybe it was too much at the time, and that's why they decreased the dosage. On the other side, though. But the response is often that they don't use AZT anymore. Yes, they, 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 they sure do. They sure, they do. sure do. And if it was killing people left and right, just like before we started this, you had told me, like, you know, if a virus is stupid enough, you know, it, it would, if it's going to kill people, why would it kill the host? Because then it's going to kill itself, basically. So why would we be using AZT if it kills people? Like the pharmaceutical company is so evil, they want to just, they don't want to kill their patients, they want to keep their patients alive so they can give them more AZT. So AZT doesn't just kill people. Wow. And the medications don't just kill every cell in your body. If Liam Sheff fights that one more time, I want to just vomit right in his face because it's so stupid and it's not even true. These these are extremes. Uh, saying that the, the drugs are, are, are harmless or at, le at the very least that the benefits outweigh the, the, the risks right. to their, they'll, they'll, you know, take one pill you're going to die. Uh, right. and, and the truth is somewhere in between. Exactly. And, and these drugs do have Adverse effects. They have adverse people. They have bad things. They have good things. They have cumulative, yeah. have cumulative effects. So taking them for three months, a year, three years is one thing. Taking them for thirty years, we don't, we don't, we haven't been using them long enough to know no. why. But we're seeing some signs of of life dystrophy, right. heart problems, liver. The, but it, don't it forget, we're really seeing people dying left and right. Don't forget the AIDS wards were all in every hospital in the country. Had, I don't in the world had AIDS wards. Just people were dying left and right. Now they're not. But we gave yeah. a little break there, but we were talking about medication ARVs. Well, you and that's one thing. You'll also, you want to you won't hear me calling it medication along <laughs> drugs. Okay. So there's these little subtle, uh, subtle things that are that are different in our vocabularies. But uh, but yeah, the, uh, but see, here's the thing: the orthodox side admits that there are side effects, there are bad side effects. That's why the distant side knows about the side effects because science is admitted to them. That's why you guys know about the side effects because you know it's research papers everywhere. That's where y'all came up with that. What well, well, first was it? Sixty six cross react cross reactions, you know, and the you know, now you're about that about yeah. But I'm just saying that's how because of peer reviewed science. That's why y'all come up with all this stuff. But yeah, science admits that there's good and bad. But you talk to Liam Sheff, you take one pill, it's gonna fucking kill you right there on the spot. Well, I don't, I don't think that's quite. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. There is this. Um, I think of like I don't know, I'm, I'm picturing like a yo-yo or a rubber band or something that that you get some momentum going and you just over you just go too far right, in, in right. one direction or another and and that there is to me you you make some good points that uh, people were dying and the drugs I mean I don't think I think it'd be really hard to argue that the drugs didn't impact yeah those this disease the so definite, uh, definite correlation I, I, but I think that the the orthodoxy because of the influence of farm pharmaceutical, they've got a big investment in this. This whole triple drug cocktail, you, you start taking it when you test it used to be well, when you C D four drop below two hundred, then four hundred minutes when you test positive. And now it's like, well if you want to keep from getting it on a Friday night, take a trubata before you go out and, and have sex. So so it's it's to me it, it's this lifetime of triple cocktail. Uh -huh. Combination therapy that is is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was I was in ACT UP. I was on the FDA building. I had to get on the building. I was a demonstration of the FDA in Washington way back when, saying drugs into bodies now. And we got that, and we got that and more. And 
I don't think we knew what we were asking for at that mm-hmm. time. And the pharmaceutical company took that leverage, and they're milking it. And I, you know, there are people on the drugs that don't need to be on the drugs. And the other thing that I've moved towards that has evolved for me is, you know, I did well for ten years without any of the drugs, mm-hmm. and and I'm grateful for that. But I got to a point where um, I was tired of watching my friends uh, refuse to take the drugs up to the point where they were hospitalized in ICU with pneumonias and, and the heroic efforts on the part of medical care was unable to bring them back. They died. And and they all had very, very low CD4 counts. This is another, this is another place I go... Um, I take issue with the dissident. What I'm hearing mostly from the dissident community is that CD4 counts are meaningless because I could go get it tested this morning and it'll be 400, and I go this afternoon and it'll be 350, and they're just all. It's like, well, that's true, but if you read, read my writing, you know I take a different point of view. Is there is a point at which you you can't just you can't. I don't know of anybody. I've yet to see the dissident community produce verifiable evidence of a group of people living well, without illness, uh-huh. who consistently have double-digit CD4 counts. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, athletes have lower CD4. Yeah, lower, that you, you, you're, you're playing low like the orthodox does. Low is under 400, under 200. I'm talking about very low and, and a trend of decline. So, so I think the drugs, getting back to the drugs, have a place. The mistake on the orthodox side is that we're going to Give you three pills a day for the rest of your life. But don't forget what the, the cocktail is for, though. Don't forget it, it hits the, the virus at different places, you know, before, before so it can't repli- before it gets into the cell, so it can't replicate once it's in the cell, so it can't get out of the, the cell. So you know, so the, it it hits the virus at different points, and that's why they have so many. That's what the cocktail is about. So it so it can't develop resistance. Right. I mean, and, re- and rebound. Yeah, that, well, that's part of the, the thought behind it. I I get that. And they, they've done a good job of making that seem reasonable. But I come back to, this is not, you did? Or, I think you did. You did. You, this is not, as a gay man in a community facing an epidemic, this is not an acceptable. This, and this is not good enough. And the drugs are not, not, the drugs, but we stopped looking for other, you know, other possible Things that are affecting the health of gay men. Mm-hmm. You're how old? I'll be 50 in a couple months. And I'm 56, so I'm six years ahead of you in the, in the gay world, too, probably. And when I came out in the 70s, all the gay doctors, it, I mean, it was like you, we were being, everybody wanted, needed to be tested for intestinal parasites. There was this thing called gay bowel syndrome. Yeah. Uh, gay men had diarrhea. They had the, the, the BB clinic here in Cam- little old Kansas City. Had a van that drove around the gay bars on Friday and Saturday nights, and Nurse Wanda Lust, who was this drag queen, would come out with her and draw blood to test for syphilis and gonorrhea. Uh-huh. We were not a healthy community. Yeah. This is back in the 70s. Uh-huh. We were already sick from multiple infections, taking antibiotics before you go out to the baths. Uh, and this was not Fire Island. This was not uh, San Francisco or QS. This was Kansas City. So. Well, I know that. I remember that time. I agree with you, but I think it's an evolution, too. Don't forget, gay people were in closet. I mean, not just closeted, but people were good. Until the 60s hit, gay people weren't even allowed basically to touch each other. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the 70s, by, by the time we were reclaiming our, our sexuality, and of course we were having a lot of sex. I mean, it's just a natural thing. And it's, it, it's evolving to the point where now we're getting married, we're becoming more monogamous. Some are, but we also still have white parties and meth parties, and there's still a subset, and it's always been the uh, the Straight argument. people don't do that? There's straight swingers bars, there are, oh yeah, straight, straight men, people do the straight drugs friends and have I, lots of sex too. The straight friends I know, they don't have sex with a dozen men a night. I've never had sex with a dozen men a night. It's not physiologically possible for you to have 12 orgasms a night. Oh, that's, that's, that's not true. Trust me. Really? I never, I can never do it. <laughs> even at my horniest, even, I've never been able to do it. So, uh, that, that's a very small subset of people. And I, and I agree, I'm not saying that gay men aren't the mysterious or never were mysterious. Now uh-huh. we've got this, this test that, 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 of antibodies that 
I, I don't. I question. I still question the the validity of that test in determining that you're going to develop AIDS. And and but we're not given a chance. We'll never know because you, you know, it's they're considered unethical to withhold treatment for somebody, right? right. And so how many people? Well, there are people out there. There are. And I'm not going to mention your name again, Brian, or uh, uh, Tomas, or others who are HIV positive and seem to not being troubled with health right, issues right, right. like some of us. And, and are they false positives? Are they, uh, you know, is this test just too nonspecific to really be able to say? And to, to me, it's, it's one piece of a of a puzzle that we need to pay attention to. I'm not saying it's, here's, here's, here's what I'm trying to get at. I don't think it's, it's everything that the orthodoxy claims to I don't think it's infallible. I don't think it means you're going to get AIDS. I also disagree with the dissident side that says it's meaningless. Uh -huh. It's clearly not meaningless. The correlation, that's another right, one. Clearly. That's one of my favorite bugaboos with the dissidents is they love to quote, correlation does not prove causation. And I want to say, but ignoring correlation can really be damaging to your right. health. Yeah. You can't just ignore it. Uh -huh. But I'm saying the dissident community needs to refocus on their message. If they really like what's going on now with medication, if you think medication needs to be the dosage needs to be cut down, then you know, then focus on that and stop telling everybody, dude, stop it. <laughs> you know, stop telling people that, you know, the the tests are meaningless or not you know HIV is meaningless. And they need to come together because like you have know, Bird on one side and the curse on the other side. Bird says, Hey, there is a virus here, it's been cultured, it's been isolated. It's been proven, you know, molecularly that there, there is a virus there. Okay, so we keep getting interrupted with dogs, but um, we were talking about you, so, you started talking about the, the other drugs, um, How and this is in the focus. Well, I, one of my contentions with dissidency right now is it seems to be uh, pretty much controlled and run by uh, people who aren't affected, uh -huh. and, and I exactly. define affected as gay men who test positive for HIV and who have evidence of health issues. That's my definition of affected. Those people are not represented anywhere except maybe on QA, and which doesn't just doesn't really have any money or any power. It's just a place to sit and talk. But well, uh, well, these people have their interests is based on, the, you know, they want to tear down the scientific right. paradigm. They, they want to march around the, the, the walls of Jericho, and, and that's their ultimate Goal is to see this whole thing collapse as a fraud and yeah. HIV doesn't exist. HIV, I, and, and I'm like, you know, yeah, it doesn't exist or it's harmless. Which is it? I mean, Duisburg says it exists, so that's why you know, I don't get. Okay, here's Duisburg and the purse. The purse never done research at all. One's a doctor and one's a lab tech. And here's another thing: people like to come down on me and my education. Uh, I'm more educated than Papadopoulos is. She's just an X-ray tech. You know, tells how much, um, you know, person has been exposed to radiation too much or something. At least I can test everything in a laboratory. I can do every test there is. So I'm more educated than she is, and yet people look up to her. And it's just cracking up the way people look and like Well, to... she has been published. Oh, has she? Oh, I didn't even know that. And where? I'd have to go to the... <laughs> mm. No, they have a reputation for... No, they've never done any actual peer-reviewed research. But anyway, that's not... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go look it up right now. Who has? Duisburg says, look, this virus has been isolated by the most rigorous standards there are. And so it actually exists. You know, he says it's harmless, and Mullah says it's harmless. Well, fine, whatever. They can say that all they want. But the virus, so I at least go with, they should all come together, at least under Duisburg, say the virus actually exists. Because the person don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> at least yeah. Duisburg knows what he's talking about as far as... <laughs> The actual virus. And he's done the research and he's educated in that field. Perth, they're not even educated, they're not virologists. One's a doctor and one's a lab tech. Uh, of any normal healthy person we can find, uh -huh. how much of, how many of them, I mean, isn't our whole part of our makeup of viruses and retroviruses? I mean, they're an integrated part of who we are. So okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Because a lot of viruses... They like to say that, that, you know, the endogenous retroviruses are oftentimes mistaken for HIV. HIV is like 10,000 base pairs. And endogenous retroviruses, because they've done the human genome project now, so they've counted that out. They know what they're talking about. The endogenous retroviruses are like 10 times that. 
the size of the HIV for retrovirus is very small. The endogenous retroviruses are huge. There's no way they can be mistaken for HIV. Well, they're completely different molecularly. You're clearly more knowledgeable on that piece than I am because I don't. Uh -huh. um, I can't contest that. I don't know. My my question remains. Uh, I, I still I still am very skeptical that HIV is the sole and sufficient cause of AIDS, but I do think it exists. Uh -huh. I, I think. You know, I don't think it's, it's not feasible to me to think that all this money, all these scientists yes. are looking at air and making things up over here. You know, that right. doesn't, that doesn't seem, uh, I can't accept that as, as anything plausible. What I do, what I, where, where my brain is right now with this is that, uh, um, <laughs> I'm having trouble staying focused too. Uh, that HIV isn't, a, because when Gal, I supposedly, discovered HIV, it was from a pool of a bunch of sick gay men who had pre-AIDS, as I recall, and I don't remember the number, but it was like, when he went back to check his findings, it was only in like a third of these gay men. Mm -hmm. So, and it was like, oh, it's overwhelming evidence. It's like, he didn't find it in everybody, or 90%, it was like less than half. So, so I think that, and I, I know you've already talked a little bit about, uh, you know, I'm not, so I'm not questioning whether HIV exists, I'm of the opinion and I'll change my mind as I get more knowledgeable, if need be, that HIV is a marker, not the cause. And so it, it does exist, it does have significance, you don't ignore it, um, but, but I think there's room to, for, for some of us that are skeptical to not make decisions based solely on that. Okay, I, but here's, here's also the thing, it's not the sole suspicion cause of AIDS, and maybe it's not. Um, the business like to say it's like, Five percent. I would say it's more like ninety percent the cause of AIDS, and there are other factors. Or eighty percent. It's a bigger part than the distance want to say it is. You see, now we're getting into a conversation that is what the distance love, and I t and I keep coming back to as an affected. Mm -hmm. I don't give a rat's ass if HIV exists or doesn't exist. Uh -huh. I don't care. I just want people to stop getting sick and dying, and and I don't want to rely. I don't. I want to find. Alternatives and options to mm -hmm. triple cocktail AIDS drugs. And I agree with you. I think you're, but see, you're more rational than the people that I see online. You, you know, people like you said, they're very dogmatic. They tow this line. Think about, not, think about the orthodox side, though. Like every time the definition of AIDS changes or anything about the HIV research changes, the dissidents grab that and say, see, see, they're wrong, they're wrong. They keep changing what they're saying. That's what science does. Science evolves as we learn more about something, science grows and evolves. Just like we said, you know, before, you know, now it's like you're supposed to treat early. Back, they used to say when I first tested, my doctor told me, he said, okay, right now, 1995, he said, we don't know if we should start you on the medication now or if we should wait until. So we made that decision together. I decided to start the medication then. And now, you know, in the beginning, they thought, well, let's, let's let it go for a long time. That's because they didn't want you on the medication for 30 years or 40 years or whatever. They didn't know how it was going to affect you. So let's wait until put it off as long as we can until you start getting sick, and they found that that's not right, so they changed that. But that's just one example of every time something changes, because we learn more about it, science will evolve and make changes. The dissonance side, they never, except, you know, a few people like you, and a few people that you told me, and I won't mention their name now because I don't know if I should, but there's some people, rational people on your side, that will accept a few changes and then change their mind. Right, yeah, that's, I mean, it's right. You know, and I don't mind saying rethinking AIDS, you know, is that, because that represents a group of people that are uh -huh. supposed to be rethinking, but I don't see a lot of no, re, I don't see anything being re, re anything. It's like they've, they've created this alternative dogma right. that, is, that is also flawed and imperfect mm -hmm. and, and getting quite old. Exactly. When I first found out, out about all this in 2008, I didn't know there were still people that, you know, didn't think HIV was whatever. But so, but none of, that, none of that has changed in these like last five, six years. Uh, none of those people have changed their mind at all. You can still see Liam Sheff and Elizabeth Eli and all those people saying how AIDS is this, you know, HIV is this one thing or not this one thing, and they haven't changed their mind at all. There's a few people who are rational like you. No, you that's the third time you said that, so you don't need to say that again. But, but I, keep coming coming back, I keep coming back to <laughs> wanting, I, to me, what I want to spend my energies and time on is is finding out if we can. Uh, I'd like to prevent AIDS. 
things. You know, I, I, I think there's uh, the gay community has a big responsibility for looking at lifestyle um, behaviors. That, but I'm an old, I'm an old buddy day, so it's easy. I've had my, I've had my 12, 12 uh -huh. orgasm in the night experience. It ain't gonna happen again in this, uh -huh. at this, right. in this decade. Wait, so, it's easy, so it's easy to say, you know, you, you need to be more. You know, I, I, I think gay men need to look at their sexuality a little, little differently, and not, it's not about seeing how extreme and right. But we're talking about gay men. Don't forget there's lesbians out there, too. There's men, women, straight, gay, whatever. Men are fucking horny. Straight men are right. horny. Gay right. men are horny. You get two gay men together. Men, men, are, always always sex. men are always on. Right. So right. straight men don't have as much sex because the women are top blocking them. Bingo. <laughs> and they, but you just said that there are straight men that are just as sexually active as gay men. And I'm saying it's not possible because they can't meet enough women. Some, they not. can't meet enough women to meet that. Level of man, like a gay man going yeah. to a white party or band there's out swingers or, parties out there. I there's, know, there's, I um, get that. what do you call it when you beat each other? S and M parties out there. <laughs> the, all that stuff happens in the yeah. straight community, just yeah. not to the extent that it does in our community. That's and that's I think the point. But, but it's not to the extent. It's a it's a matter of it's like a lot of things. It's not whether you do this or you do that. It's 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 abusing something. But it's not whether you it's societal thing, whether things. Whether you abuse it, it's not whether you. No, I, I agree. Uh, but it's societal too, because now that it, we're actually able to get married, now things are going to change because society is looking at us differently. So it's, people are going to say less promiscuous as they're able to get married and have kids and have families, and they're not going to well, see. Yeah. It breaks my heart because uh, I I I was closeted when I was a kid. Came out in a little town. You and then, and then I became a gay activist. I I. I Broke through those closet doors to change. I mean, I helped pass gay rights here in Kansas City, I, and it breaks my heart that young gay people, young gay men, are being encouraged and, and, and told to take this fucking pill to, to or they die. Basically, that's, and that's what it boils down to: is you take this pill or you die. I, I just, I just think we really failed ourselves as a community if, if we think that's good enough. But that's the way it started. If when people had the virus and it wasn't treated, they died. Well, a large percentage of them died. People died. I don't know. We weren't even able to test for the virus when people were first dying. So well, I was just listening to NPR the other day, and they were doing the whole thing about the um, history of, of HIV and. From my recollection, I didn't get to listen to all of it, but um, it's like they discovered now, like at first, I think the first known case was in 1966 or 56, I can't remember which. So, yeah, it's been around for longer than we've known about it, but not still, it hasn't been around since the 1800s. At least not in humans. So, I think, I think it's just an evolution, and the more we learn about it, the more it's going to change. And get better. So I don't think I don't think we're going to change each other's minds or, or general perspectives. You helped me um, s see past what I was reading on your blog to see a, a different Todd. Well, that was a, also an evolution of me too. Back then, when I first found out about this, these people, like I said, I, would, I read a lot about this stuff, and I just thought there's some crazy fuckers out there. So I started, at first I started making fun of it. And then I started thinking it was very dangerous and it wasn't quite so funny anymore. Your your new blogs are you've really taken on a different they really come across differently. They're much more the, the, Yeah, because the, I've learned. I've learned the campy, much. trashy, right. caustic is gone for the most part. And it's much more uh, it's well written and it's more credible. Are you talking about my new blog HIV Innocence Group Truth? That one? <laughs> Just taking the task of certain man named Clark Baylor? Well, let's, you want to talk about that? <laughs> I'm sure. That's fine with me because everything on my blog is researched and documented. Because, you know, uh, Baker and OMSJ are sort of the rising stars of AIDS. This they the won't leave when they start, when people start seeing. He's got people practically prostrating themselves um, to him. He's, he's something else. Yeah, well, once, I think once, this skeptical myself. once this lawsuit is over, and I can't really talk about it right now, but, you know. You've seen on his blog, he's trying to try this in the court of public opinion. You've seen he wrote a, a lengthy diatribe on his blog about the lawsuit and what his his claims are. I have not even touched that because I'm going to let it go through the court system like it's supposed to. But once this lawsuit is over with, and I'm able to really, really start blogging and posting about all the untruths in that lawsuit, people are going to see him for who he is. 
Well, you've already written, what you have already written about is is challenging his um, his, his claims his yeah. claims of success right. on court cases. Right. And you've gotten lawyers that I've got now five independent lawyers on five different cases who have all said he was not involved in their cases whatsoever. He made a phone call to them and said, hey, I hear you've got this case. Can I help? And they were basically asking him to say, um, well, we'll see. We'll see what we can do. And no, they said no, he didn't. All he did was make a phone call. Maybe sent them some documentation, but they did not use it. So at least five cases, not to mention the other cases that I've got posted on there. Well, there's five different uh, things that went to trial. He lost every case. He's lost everything that's gone to trial. The only ones I can't prove are the ones that went to military courts because it's so much, it's hard to get the documentation. But there's definitely five cases that went to trial that he lost. Um, there's several other things on there that um, were, um, the charges were dropped because of precedent and another, you know, from a previous case. There was things where the, um, the defendant tested negative, so those charges were dropped. It's well, full, it's basically a sham. I remember when you and I were betting heads, and I would uh, send it forward an email to Clark or something. And the response was pretty much, I'm paraphrasing, uh, Deshaun is a nothing. Deshaun right. has no, you know, credibility. He's a, he's a, a meth addict living in the basement of his mom's house. Uh, ignore him. Ignore him. Don't give him any energy or attention. So I'm finding it kind of ironic now that just a, a couple of years later, he all of a sudden finding you significant enough that he's Expending, a federal res lawsuit. expending resources to sue you, and if you can't talk about it, I'll I'll summarize it. You can correct, you can stop me if you think I'm. Well, for, before the lawsuit, don't forget there was an arbitration that I won. That's right. On That's all three right. points. And, and, but, the, but what is the what is what's, what is the case about? It's about you using the name HIV Innocent Project Truth as a as a as a, as a domain name when Clark has uh, domains called HIV. Innocence group, group that he's um, copyrighted, right? So he's he's claiming copyright violations and, and this and that, and yet, uh, and there's a, you you go out and, and type FordSucks.com or uh, uh, yeah, you know Sprint sucks. You're gonna find people that have taken a, a main name, added something to right. it, uh, less flattering than truth, right? And and running with it. So, and, and, and they lost in those cases, and that's why in, in the um, arbitration, I found cases like that and presented it to the arbitrator and said, here, here's my proof that I'm not, well, and it's been done in the Clark past. himself has also created website domains that are impinging on other people's names, like Innocence names, Project. Well, what about, well uh, there was that too. Yeah. Uh, James Murtock.com, I believe. Yeah. Which is, um, Clark's quite proud of, but it's like, um, basically discrediting an individual with their, their name. So yeah. it's like, sure, you know, to me, it's very, uh, I'm not blaming for being pissed at you. That's perfectly yeah. understandable that to, to, to engage the resources. And we don't know what I don't know. And I don't know, maybe you do or don't, I can't talk about it. I don't know if the money for these lawsuits is coming out of OMSJ's pockets or out of Clark's personal pockets. Yeah. But my issue, and, I, and I've written about this, so I'm not, I don't, I, we don't need to keep beating up on individuals and organizations, but I think it, I, I've done research into, as best I can, into the finances of some of the dissident organizations, and OMSJ is a one-man show. There's no board, there's no oversight, it's Clark Baker. It's a, it's a one-person non, I'm not, I don't even know how he actually does it. Well, I think one person how is a benefactor. How one person can create a non-profit organization, uh, I, I don't doubt it's legal, because Clark should know the law, um, but but it certainly does raise a lot of questions in my mind because I've seen um, enough scams to know when you don't have oversight, you don't have transparency, yeah. you're creating an environment for corruption. Right. Growth. And you think with all that money, like like um, I think 2012 he had 400000 dollars in donations, but he doesn't itemize where all that money goes. So that's you're supposed to do that as a 401. Over a certain amount. Yeah. Over a certain amount. Now he's very he's not his, his, nine, his 990s are, are pretty much useless compared to the 990s that you're thinking AIDS uh -huh. uh, has published because they sort of they, they sort of spill all they spill it all and uh, you, you can learn a lot from those. But um, well, just like you said, like you know, part of this lawsuit is defamation. 
And you just said, like, he's called me a meth addict, he's called me an alcoholic, he's called me all sorts of shit online. He's defamed me much worse than I've ever, I'm talking like a liar or something. Well, I think, I don't, I'm not going to get into who's been worse, I think both sides have been pretty unseemly. But no, no, that's the only thing I'm saying, both sides have been horrible, but, you know, how can he accuse me of defamation when he's done much worse to me? Well, and to, to put you, uh, I think, I'm, I'm just speculating now that he thought a lawsuit would put you... In a real spot because you wouldn't have the resources to defend exactly. against. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm such a pharmacist and I've got so much money from the pharmaceutical companies, I could have just thrown a million dollars at this lawsuit and been done with it. But I had to get pro bono attorneys. That's a pretty significant pro bono. I uh, sure did. And I can guarantee I think that when this lawsuit is over, I'm surprised him. When this lawsuit is over, when this lawsuit is over, he is going to claim that I got these pro bono attorneys because I'm connected and I'm so well connected. That's why I got these kick-ass attorneys. Well, he's got to come up for some reason for losing the case. But I got these kick-ass attorneys because they believe in freedom of speech. That's why I got these kick-ass attorneys, because I've got it out there that I needed attorneys to represent me in a freedom of speech case, and that's all this boils down to is freedom of speech. Right. Well, I, I, I don't think he can win it, so, and I don't, I don't know all the details. No, he's going to lose it. He's going to lose big. It's going to cost him however much he's, his attorneys are charging him. And it's just going to be funny when this is all said and done with and I can actually start blogging about all the crap in that lawsuit that's not true. Well, I know that's... Then it's really going to paint a picture of who I he is. I know that's eating at you. Oh, I can't wait. I've already written a lot of posts. They're just all ready to just hit that publish button. And I'm sure if this and when, if and when this sees the light of day, I'll, I'll, I'll start getting the uh, feedback, too. Imagine I'm... I don't know. I, I'm curious to see if I'm going to be seen as some kind of Benedict Arnold uh -huh. or traitor to the cause or something. And and I'm just, I'm, I, I came into this, that what's known as, you know, there's there's dissidents and then there's, you know, these groups that, that you wear that label. You're thinking A's on SJ, per group. But there's there's other work going on, and you, you mentioned this too. I've published a bit about the, 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 uh, is it in Germany or France? The doctor Leibowitz. Leibowitz is uh, doing alternatives with with dosage, dosage yeah. and and things like that. And those are things that, that they don't identify as dissidents, but they're doing the kind of work that I, that interests me. Right. Um, but I came into dissidents. I I quit my drugs before I ever knew there was an AIDS dissident community. So I felt like I was a, a dis. If, if quitting your drugs is a sign of dissidents, then I, I was a distant part of the about this community, and after how many years has it been? About, about seven years, maybe, involvement. The more I see and learn, the more dysfunctional I realize it is. And that's, yeah. I don't I don't say that to give comfort to the enemy. I I say that because I think people's lives are at risk, right. and and that there are people who really want to be who, who are inclined to. You know, kind of, I hate the word denialism, but it's so appropriate sometimes of, of just wanting to pretend to believe something mm -hmm. will make it different or right. not leave. And, and that just, be so that just violates a lot of my intellectual... <laughs> yeah, things would get done better and be, be better if people like us would sit down and, I mean... Yes. Why do I have to be... I, like if Baker would have come to me, actually, if he'd have called me on the phone and we could have discussed mm -hmm. the problems I have with his... Innocence group and you know his lack of transparency. If we get to talk about that and make some compromises, we wouldn't be where we're at right now. You know what could he have just? Get, and I, as the arbitration was over, I called him like a man. I, I waited like two or three weeks because I knew he'd be pissed that I won. I gave him about three weeks and I called him and said, Clark, this is Todd. The arbitration is over. Are we done with this? And he was furious. No, my attorney's already working on a lawsuit. We're going to sue you. We're going to get you in court. We're going to depose Dr. Gallo and all this bullshit. I'm like, what the fuck is Gallo in on this? But he got this big conspiracy. So anyway, my point is, if we could just talk like human beings and not be furious with each other, you know. And I think that's why things will be a lot better. I know that's why I wanted to uh, make this video happen. Because I, to me, I wanted people to see that the two people from very different points of view could could sit down and talk. Yeah. We, and got more in common than we, got we don't have to. We, we are discovering we have a lot in common, and that doesn't mean we agree on everything. Exactly. It doesn't mean I've converted you or you've converted me. I'm, right. still, I'm still a skeptic. I'm still 
I don't want to use the word distant. I'm still a questioner and I'm still a skeptic. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm distance, I've walked away from distance. So, um, I, I still, I still uh, lurk in that community sometimes. So, so do, do you want to, do you want to, is there something else you want to add? We've probably been going at no, that. I think people would keep more, keep a, keep more of an open mind and not be so black and white about everything. You know, like, like you thought I was so black and white about certain things until you found out I'd taken AZT and told my doctor I wouldn't take it anymore, and then I went on a drug holiday at one point, and, and I then I did it partly because I couldn't fucking afford my medications because the pharmaceutical yeah. company. And you also told me because the insurance company was charging me up the ass for my medications. I, I don't so, understand why if you have insurance. Because in I, I changed my insurance to where I had that stupid health savings account. I didn't realize it was going to cost me three thousand dollars out of pocket. Of course, you know that's nothing to me since I'm a pharmaceutical shell and I'm worth millions, but. <laughs> well, I have no. I am, I'm, so I wasn't going to pay three thousand dollars out of my pocket, so I I'm said, "I'll wait for a year." I'm on disability, have Medicare, and I'm not my eligible, and I'd have to come up with twenty eight hundred dollars for my drugs really? uh, before they'll before they'll pay anything, and uh, to to have to get through that Medicare drug donut hole. So my drugs are coming from uh, one of the things is the result of this, and we didn't get into a lot about the reduced dosing and stuff, but that's another time. Because people are skipping doses and reducing and all that, there's a surplus. There's a glut of drugs out there. Mm-hmm. And I'm having these extra drugs. French are sending them to me from Germany. And you got any Truvada? I need some Truvada. I don't have Truvada. <laughs> I don't Truvada. have any Truvada. I'm sure there's a bunch of it out there. Uh, but it's coming from other countries. And uh-huh. it's just, uh, I think about it, it's just, I, when I go out to the mailbox and get this package, and. That's uh, hilarious. Oh, I just got to show you. <laughs> What do you think of marketing and everything? I get, I get this package Stop it. from Scotland. And I think I'm going to find pill bottles or something. And it's just, it's just, no, it's just a bag full of pills in a, in a bubble wrap. I opened that and I thought, Another one came packed with Easter eggs. So, so this, this is how we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, it's resistant and, uh, in order. Uh, and I, I read, and I recognize them, but, you know, it, it's, it's like, you know, you, you're talking about that movie, uh, <sighs> Dallas Virus Club. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like shades of, I haven't seen it yet. Shades of, uh, you know, criminality here just to get drugs without having to, Work over the money. I, 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 I could come up with twenty eight hundred. I have to have to put it on a credit card. But it's like, you know, you have a nice house and a huge TV. I think you got the money. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wondered what. Tony has a beautiful house, by the way, and a beautiful yard. <laughs> <laughs> I have a beautiful partner. Yeah, I like your boyfriend. He's so. He, he worked his ass off for thirty five years uh-huh. for companies like AT and T, Western Electric, Bank of America. Got laid off. From Bank of America when he was 60 years old, and before he's he was years old? he's you know he's 60, he'll be 64 this year. Oh, I didn't think he was 60. Anyway, I thought he was old. I don't know there, but Michael has worked his ass off, and Michael's always <laughs> participated in the uh-huh. savings plans. So Michael has uh, a comfortable retirement, yeah. uh, uh, or did have until the, the stock market, right? Yeah. But that's we have a, a you know. It's his. I think that's his money. That's for his retirement. Oh, great. And if he spends it saying. all, you know, on me, so there is, you know, it is frustrating. It is complicated. Cause oh, I, ask, complicated. I ask people that help me it's pay hard. for my alternative care. Well, I, you know, it's like five, ten thousand dollars a year we spend, and it's money that's coming out of his. Yeah. 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 But we're talking to the person too. Like you can tell he's just somebody you can talk to about anything. He looks you right in the eye when he's talking to you. He's pulling like. Okay. Well, I have a three-way before I leave. I don't know. I the camera. <laughs> okay. You didn't think I had a sense of humor, did you? No, I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, 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 I think that Twisted is right, and I think you're, you're reminding me of these toxic, caustic drag queens. I did drag once. I don't think she them. I look like she needs I, I think we ought to go ahead and cut this. Yeah, I got to come along. Left me a voicemail.